Right, in this video we're going to take a look at a particular problem the city has at the moment. Uh, they're not going to shout about it because obviously they don't want everyone to think they don't know what they're doing, but they have a problem and it is that one of their key models, which was always a little suspect, is now pretty much bust. Uh, it's called the Capital Asset Pricing Model. That's a horrendous mouthful, don't worry. Essentially it's a tool used uh, to help analysts value shares. Uh, it wasn't originally designed for that, it was designed for whole portfolios, but it's been kind of uh, used and tweaked as a way of uh, pricing shares and looking for expected returns. So we're going to be asking two key questions in this video uh, about the capital asset pricing model, and we'll find that in fact neither of them is very easy to answer at the moment. And if you can't answer those two key questions, then the model doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So, if that all sounds a bit technical, don't worry, we're not going to go into a great deal of technical detail. Uh, we're going to go far enough just to explore the idea that, well, if the city doesn't know how to price a share, um, what are you supposed to do? And the answer is, uh, you can't trust share prices at the moment. Shares, as you know, are incredibly volatile. You need to do a bit of homework and seek comfort elsewhere. Don't rely on analysts to do the hard work for you, because uh, they'll do hard work but it won't necessarily throw out the right kind of answers. Okay, so what is this uh, horrendous beast called the Capital Asset Pricing Model, um, or CAPM? So here it is. Uh, I'm not going to labour this point. We'll get straight into it in a moment, but the Capital Asset Pricing Model. You know, in the city, they like to give things long names because you can usually charge more that way. So capital asset pricing model, or occasionally you'll hear a journalist say CAPM for short. Now, before going into any detail, here's a key question. If you're an investor and you're about to buy a share, what return do you expect from it? Now, if you can't answer that question, why are you risking putting your money in shares? Okay, people say it's impossible to answer. Well, if that's the case, stick your money in a bank account where the risk is hopefully close to zero and you can earn a nice, steady, predictable fixed return. Do not go anywhere near shares because shares are risky. You can lose all of your capital investing in shares if the company goes bust. So as an investor, you should be able to answer the question, and if you've never thought about it before, start thinking about it now, um, what return do I expect on my investment? And that is linked to another question which is, what else could I do with my money? <clears throat> People don't think about this often enough. You know, if you're going to put a thousand pounds into shares, where else could that thousand pounds be? And if the answer is somewhere safer, like government IOUs, then the return you expect, surely, from shares must be quite a bit higher than that. Because if you can put your money into somewhere where it won't disappear overnight, then surely the return you must expect from shares, which are much more volatile, companies can go bust, must be quite a bit higher. And underlying this model are two key questions, which every investor should be able to answer. You'd have to be a city expert to answer these. You ought to be thinking about them before you put a single pound into shares tomorrow morning. Number one, what is the minimum return I could get for investing somewhere completely safe? Do I know the answer? Is there such a thing as somewhere safe to invest? And if so, how much more do I want for investing in shares? Double, treble, 10 times the same? Okay, the second question in particular is not easy to answer, but if you can't answer it, frankly, you're playing a bit of a roulette game buying shares at all. Now, the CAPM model is the city's attempt, in a way, to answer the question, what expected return do I want from the shares I'm about to buy? And uh, effectively, you know, what's the minimum I should expect for taking the risk of buying shares when I could buy safe government IOUs, for example? Um, and, you know, is my view of the shares above or below the number that CAPM kicks out? So CAPM will give you an answer, if you like, in a moment we'll see 9%. And if you expect a share to return 15%, then CAPM says at current levels, it's cheap, so you should buy. So that's what CAPM is all about. It's about looking at the expected return, the sort of minimum level an investor should respect, expect for taking the risk of buying a particular share. Okay. Problem with it is, not only does it make huge assumptions, but that's fine. You know, f um, predicting where a share will be in a year's time, expected returns isn't easy, I accept that. But, but there's another problem, which is two of the key assumptions that the CAPM model makes 
no longer hold. And if that's the case, the model is broken. And the problem is it's still used quite widely as the basis for pricing shares around the city. It's not exclusive. There are other ways the city prices shares, but this one is still heavily used. It's been around since the, well, it depends who you ask, but it's been around since the 1960s. Nobel Prize winners came up with it, so there must be something behind it. But at the moment, it's struggling big time. Okay, so uh, next time you ask someone who works in the city in a pinstripe soup, uh, suit, um, you know, the, the price of a share or how to price a share, they might look a little anxious, a little nervous, because uh, they'll know in the back of their minds that one of their key models isn't working right now. So they'll probably make up an answer. Right, now, what is the capital asset pricing model and which bits are broken? Okay, let's, let's go for it. Now, there's a little formula here, and the word formula may mean that I've lost a few viewers already, but hang on in there, because actually it's not a big, scary formula of the sort you saw at school, all right? Uh, certainly I saw it at school. Um, so, the city's formula for pricing shares is bust. What is that formula? Well, CAPM says the expected return, and I'm not going to use too much mathematical algebra here because people hate that. So the expected return from a share is a function of the return you could get from something risk-free. Now, is anything risk-free? Uh, I mean, if I put my money under the mattress, is that risk-free? No, because if my house burns down or it gets nicked, it's all gone. Well, maybe I've got insurance, but maybe the insurance doesn't cover it. So when you start to think about it, finding somewhere that is actually risk-free, not that easy. And it's certainly not easy now, but we'll come back to that. So it's the risk-free rate. That's the minimum. So if I'm buying shares, I've got to get at least that out of them. Otherwise, why take the risk of buying shares? All right. Um, but I want more than that. Plus, uh, big bracket, don't panic about that. It's not too bad. Plus, the difference between what shares as a group offer over this risk-free rate times a specific risk factor called a beta, again, don't panic yet, um, which is a specific risk factor for the share I'm looking at, say Tesco or National Grid. So I'll put some numbers in a moment, make it easier, but the risk-free rate plus basically the difference between, um, if you like, the expected return from shares, as an asset class, as opposed to you know commodities or property, minus that risk-free rate times something called beta. <clears throat> now that might look absolutely horrific, but it's actually not that bad. It's asking in plain English some quite sensible questions. What is the minimum rate you can expect from an investment that requires you to take no risk? There, must, there is one out there, and we'll talk about what it is in a moment. What's the difference between that and what you expect from shares as an asset class, say FTSE 100 or UK shares? Not a specific one, just shares generally. So in other words, how much more of a return do you want from buying shares as opposed to this risk-free asset? And then if you're looking at, say, Tesco, what do you need to tweak that by to get to Tesco? Because presumably Tesco doesn't behave like the rest of the market. It might be a bit more volatile, a bit less volatile. So when the market goes up 10%, does Tesco go up 20? Does it, does it go down 10? Or what happens? And that's what beta is all about. All right? It's a little specific company adjustment for risk, if you like. Now, here's how, before I talk about two specific problems, all right? and the two problems are going to be that is getting more and more difficult to find, and that the so-called equity risk premium, the extra amount an investor demands for buying shares as a group, as opposed to sticking their money into a risk-free asset, isn't true anymore. And there isn't one. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So two problems. And once you've got those two problems, frankly, even if beta works all right, that's two out of three. If the components of the formula bust, well, that's enough. Okay, so essentially this thing breaks down. And if you don't know what the expected return from a particular share is, how are you ever going to judge whether you're paying a fair price for it or not? Virtually impossible. Okay, because the price you pay now is supposed to take account of the returns you expect to generate from the share in the future. Okay, I mean, that's why you buy shares, because they generate dividends, they generate capital gains. You're not just throwing your money in for nothing. Okay, so 
example, all right, and then we'll look at the two problems. Imagine, just to show you how this works, it's actually not, not very complicated, um, the risk-free rate is, for argument's sake, pull a number out of the air, 3%. <clears throat> um, very quickly, I'm going to talk about in a moment where that comes from. What is that? But let's say it's 3%. Plus, now, if I just move that up a bit and call it the ERP, so it's give myself a bit of space, come back to that concept in just a moment, plus the difference between what people expect to earn from shares minus that risk-free rate. Well, let's say that if I said to you tomorrow morning, you've got a choice, you can put £1,000 into a risk-free asset or £1,000 into shares, how much more do you want annually to take that risk? I've got to entice you in. I can't offer the same, I'll offer you more. How much do you want? Do you want double? Do you want treble? Okay, well, let's say the market's view is that for taking the risk of investing in shares, let's say people are looking for um, 8% and the risk-free rate, we said, is 3%. So in other words, the equity risk premium is 5%, right? That's what people demand annually for putting their money in shares, not in something a lot safer. And the beta factor for my company is 1.2. All right, now I'll talk about where that comes from in a moment. What this kicks out is 5% times 1.2 is 6. So 3% plus 6% is 9%. So cap M kicks out an expected return of 9%. And the way this works is, well, if cap M says the minimum you should demand for buying this particular share is 9%, okay, if you're thinking, actually, do you know what? I personally think this share can do 15%, then at current levels, it's cheap. You want to buy it. Equally, if cap M kicks out 9%, you want to see it that way, and you're thinking realistically, this share is only good for 5%, that's your personal assessment, um, then at current levels, it's not worth buying. So that's kind of one way of looking at how cap M works. Why is it broken? Problem number one, what is that? Leave aside, is it 3%? <clears throat> what is the risk-free rate? Traditionally, the risk-free rate has been viewed as, I could put a thousand pounds into government IOUs issued by AAA rated government. So what's the biggest AAA rated government in the world or economy in the world? America. So typically a 10 year medium term AAA rated government bond from the US gives you the risk free rate return. You put your money in there, you're not going to risk not getting it back. American economy is not going to go bust is the theory and you get a nice steady sort of income stream. Okay, nice steady yield. So imagine the yield or return on a 10-year treasury issued by the US government is 3%. I've made up that number. Risk-free rate. Problem is this. Standard & Poor's recently downgraded the US from AAA. So suddenly, the world's risk-free asset is no longer risk-free. And if you don't have a risk-free asset, if that's genuinely true, how are you ever going to benchmark anything against it? So that's caused a certain amount of panic. You know, what is the risk-free asset now? I mean, for, for donkey's years, the assumption's been the American government issues bonds that will never fail under any circumstances, no matter what um, maturity they have, what coupon rate they have. Well, hang on a minute. If ratings agencies are wobbling about the strength of the American economy, the risk-free asset has disappeared. Well, it's certainly become a lot harder to track down. And what do you do? Do you substitute the UK for the American economy? Would you want to do that right now? Do you look at some kind of euro bond that doesn't even exist at the moment? Where do you go? Do you, do you substitute US for China? Who knows? Okay. So that's big problem number one. The model for years, since the 60s, has been underpinned by the idea that the US government provides something that gives everybody the benchmark, the risk-free rate, the rate to beat when they buy shares. And that's gone. Number two. There is an assumption in Cap M that you should always expect to get more from shares generally than you get from US Treasuries. That's not true either. Last 10 years, okay, if you compare the total return from US Treasuries to the total return from global equities, you find global equities lose. All right, well, hang on a minute. Aren't I supposed to be getting an extra return from shares because they're riskier? Yes, you are, but you're not. So that assumption, which is rather uncomfortable if you start thinking about it, has also gone. All right? So if you like, that blows that out of the water. That is under a lot of pressure if it's not been blown out of the water. And that just leaves something I don't want to hammer to death today. Perhaps we'll take it on in another video. Beta. Now, 
Really, the model's already blown by the time you get to beta, but what is beta? Beta simply says, 1.2 was my number I made up there. Um, actually, if I'm buying Tesco, for example, I'm not buying the equity market with its equity risk premium of 5%, I'm buying Tesco. And you can't just assume that Tesco is the market. Okay, it's not that big, it's pretty big, but it's not that big. So what beta does, that's uh, analysts looking back over time, two years or five years and saying, well, historically, um, when the stock market has gone up 10%, uh, Tesco has gone up a bit more. Okay, it's gone up by 1.2 times. Okay, so the beta is 1.2. All right, um, another stock might have a beta of um, two. So every time the market goes up, say 10%, the stock goes up 20%. All right, it's possible to have a very low beta. Maybe when the market goes up 10%, historically, the stock only rises by 5%, in which case beta would be 0.5. So beta is an attempt to capture what a stock does versus what the wider market does. In other words, to sort of gauge the relative volatility of a particular stock, if that's what you're looking at using CAPM. Okay, now I won't hammer that to death. There's plenty of stuff out in the ether on exactly what beta is, and that's not really my point today. Um, two of the other components of the model are effectively under a lot of pressure if they haven't already gone bust. So in summary, CAPM since the 1960s has underpinned an awful lot what City does in terms of asking the question, what return do you expect in, you know, from a share or from shares generally? And therefore, um, you know, what should you be prepared to pay to take account of the extra risk inherent in shares? There are essentially three components of the model, a risk-free rate, an expected return from equities and a little tweak for the individual share you're looking at. The two bits of the model that um, seem to be at the moment, frankly, um, useless if you like, risk-free rate. I mean, what is that? The American economy under such pressure. Okay, and QE and quantitative easing, which I cover in another video, um, you know, being rattled around at the moment. And what is the overall equity risk premium if, over the last 10 years, there isn't one? You know, the model asks a question that can't be answered. Okay, so uh, next time you see a broker nervously walking down the street, and one of the reasons they'll look nervous, if it isn't because they've just lost their job, is that uh, where well, you'd ask them what the correct price to pay for a share is at the moment, I suspect if they were being honest, they'd have to say, do you know what, Tim? I haven't got a clue.